Welcome to the You, Me, We Amplified Podcast, interviews with women leading social impact, hosted by Suzanne F. Stevens, international speaker, author, and multi-award-winning social entrepreneur and founder of the You, Me, We Social Impact Group. Enjoy the wisdom that will be a compass on how to make your contribution count for you, your organization, and your community. We are live today on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, and AirMeet. Welcome to those of you who are able to join us live and to watch the recording and for future engagement, post questions on the guest exclusive wisdom exchange TV.com page. You'll also find hundreds of interviews with women internationally leading a social impact. I'm so excited today. We are so excited to have Kathy Willis as our guest. Kathy is the executive director of Huron Heronia Transition Homes. I'm going to call it HTH moving forward because I say it a lot. So Heronia Transition Homes, a charitable organization in Simcoe County working to end all violence against all women. Kathy has always been a strong feminist advocate in the anti-violence movement. Under Kathy's leadership, Huronia Transition Homes has grown from a single program women's shelter to a multi-program countrywide organization. They offer a women's shelter with specialized services for women who have been sex trafficked, sex assaulted consulting, advocacy center, a children's program for children exposed to abuse against their mothers, and most recently a social enterprise called Operation Grow. And this is really quite exciting because in 2018, Kathy received the Ministry of the Attorney General's Victim Service Award of Distinction for her innovation and commitment to support women. Coming to you all the way from Midland, Ontario, Canada, we welcome Kathy. It's great to have you here. It's great to be here, Susan. Thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of Wisdom Exchange. It's really exciting. Well, I tell you, Kathy, I've been wanting to interview you for two years because I've been so impressed with the work that you're doing. And you've been working at Heronia Transition Homes for like 27 years. Yes, yes. Wow. <laughs> what is it? I never about? thought I would have worked, uh, worked uh, so long in one place. Well, especially such a high demand emotionally. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. What is it about this work that drives you to persevere for almost three decades? I think um, I just wholeheartedly believe that we can make huge and impactful change in our communities. And I think that we can do that on an individual level, but also on a, on a social and a political level. And so I've been able to work at HTH and been able to, uh, in, 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 in meeting our mandate, I've been able to build and build more of an organization that holistically addresses violence against women. And so I guess the short answer would be because I've never gotten bored in, uh, with this organization. And the longer answer would be that I've had an incredible community to work with and incredible boards to work with and, and champions in the community that have allowed us to uh, really become a, a holistic organization. So over your time, you know, how many women, do you know how many women you've helped? Wow. Um, that's a really good question. Nobody's ever asked me that question. There, you know, I, I guess under my leadership, thousands and thousands and thousands of women. And I've done that across the country. I started my anti-violence work in Lethbridge, Alberta, and then went up to the Northwest Territories for a while and uh, had the uh, opportunity to come back to my home, which is Simcoe County, which is Georgian Bay. I, I was able to uh, help to establish my friend's house in Collingwood before I, I came over to Huronia Transition Homes, which is just around the bay uh, yeah. in Midland. And um, yes, uh, I know each year our organization serves well over a thousand women and kids. So. The, the impact it gets to be far reaching after a while, absolutely. Well, it's interesting. I don't know if you know, I'm from calling, I live in Collingwood now. I'm not from Collingwood, but I do live here. And I was just meeting with my friend's house yesterday. And I had mentioned this interview with you and they, and they love the work that you're doing. So I didn't realize you had uh, started 
my friend's house, also a, a fabulous uh, shelter. Mm -hmm. In now, in asking that question, you know, what, how many women have you helped? The question we really is, is what does help look like? Wow, and that's um, that's a really good question, and I think. I think what it is, I, I would, I would, I would maybe rephrase that question and say, how many women have I supported or have we supported? Because that's really what it is. You mm -hmm. know, women. It is about opening doorways for women. It's about uh, building women's confidence and and self-esteem after some very horrific things have happened to them. Uh, sometimes generationally, it's uh, you know, it's uh, it's it's been a legacy that uh, uh, violence has been a legacy that they've carried so I think um, it is really about giving women the support they need and 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 in that way I would say helping women find their own voice and understanding what they really truly want from them themselves and how to how to actualize uh, their their aspirations and their dreams and their hopes and and I think that that's critical to changing the landscape of violence one is empowering individual women and and two it, it is also about changing communities' attitudes and values towards uh, towards women, towards uh, 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 equity and inclusion, and what it means to build healthy, strong, vibrant community. Yeah, and and thanks for that because it was interesting when I was looking at that word help. I actually have three other ways of saying it. <laughs> you know, what does success look like? Mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the day, what ultimately are you trying to achieve in, in women finding their voice and having confidence? Is there anything else that you're trying to assist those women with having in, and that would be, we've done our job and they're ready to, to go out and, and be the, their best selves under their, their new circumstances? You know, I think the the overall vision, the the big vision, is really it, it's beyond it's it's even beyond women. It's about building peace and building equity. You know, building a world where we all feel like we're safe and supported. And I I think so. I think it it is it it that's the thing about violence against women is that if we're going to actually eradicate violence against women, then we have to get to those root causes. And the root causes are the things that perpetuate inequality. Um, and and I think I've lost your question, which I'll probably do because your questions are broad. I tend to get lost and I take the one path, the one roadway. No, and, and that's fine. That's yeah. fine. Uh, not to worry, they will get, they get they go broad and, and wide and you take me where you want to go and that's where I will follow. So let's let's talk about inequality. You mentioned there's many things that that cause inequality and and what are some of those things that women have have that you've identified or some of the top three things that cause that inequality? Mm -hmm. Poverty is huge. Mm -hmm. You know, poverty is uh, until we wholeheartedly address poverty, I, I think we will always uh, be facing violence against women or, or working to respond to the impacts of violence against women. So poverty is big. I think racism is, is huge and understanding power, privilege and dominance and how those things play out for us. I think um, when we when we begin understanding how I, I can't get away from poverty and that's actually how we we came to you know building a social enterprise operation grow which i'm sure we'll talk about today but it is if we are unable to address some of the core reasons why women can't leave abusive relationships or why women get trapped in in abusive relationships poverty would be one of the top reasons and and i think you know, 25 or 30 years ago, when I was speaking about ending violence against women, we we were talking about equity somewhat differently. At that time, we were talking about um, understanding uh, gender role stereotypes, and and they, although they still impact us, you know, we're seeing a, a lot of movement in 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 our day in our day to day society, and that. Uh, 
that would suggest that um, stereotypes are less impactful, but are they really? You know, when we when we think about it, and I think it it may have been Gloria Steinem who said it will will know we've addressed the stereotypes when we talk about um, wanting our sons to be more like our daughters rather than our daughters being more like our sons, and and I think that 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 is a that is a critical piece, and and we need to. Um, I, I mean, we just, we have to look at and address violence on every level in order to eradicate it, right? And when we do, we will live in a peaceful state, not only, not only in our own communities or not only in our own homes, but in the world, right? If we, if we, if we eradicate power and control, then we will create a peaceful globe. This episode is sponsored by Make Your Contribution Count for You, Me, We, a book written by Suzanne F. Stevens. It's time to act. Let this book be your compass to having a sustainable social impact while living your most meaningful life. Visit youmewe.ca slash book for more information. Thanks for listening. Now back to the podcast. I love what you're saying, and I think we're, you know, you're you're hitting a lot of chords with me personally. Um, I think we are on a precipice of, of uh, where many of the female stereotypes and, and characteristics that in, are inherent in us are being seen more in men and being accepted. Matter of fact, I'm I'm probably running a conference on that very topic <laughs> because I think men can learn a lot from how women lead organizations, how they collaborate, how they have relationships, be it how they show companionship, how they show friendship. So uh, that's that's my hope for Women's Day this year is actually put everything on its head and say what we do bring to the table, not not only what we need, but what we also bring to the table. So it's an it's an interesting time for that that conversation. I couldn't agree with you more. And I know you're a huge advocate and, and appreciate the intergenerational nature of poverty and abuse. I would can you tell us um, how that abuse and poverty and if they're different or the same create that ripple effect from generation to generation how do you see that happening yeah um well i think i think if you are a young child and you are being exposed to violence against your mom or yourself are being abused then it 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 becomes your your day-to-day -day survival is very different and maybe i'll just i'll just hit it right to to something i've been talking about more and more lately is um i i i started in this life pretty impoverished but not completely impoverished you know like it was back in a time i'm 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 nearing 60 years old but when i was young my mother was on uh, social assistance, but even even in in that context, we were poor, but there was enough to make ends meet, as as mm -hmm. they used to say. And now I see that erosion of the social safety net uh, to such a degree that when people are on social assistance now, um, they can't afford to pay the rent and buy groceries. You know, like there's not a standard of living that comes with with that that social safety net. So and, and so I I grew up in 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 poverty. I I was in a home where oftentimes my mother was being abused or at times I was being abused. So right away when we start to factor in how did that manifest then when I was in school, you know, how how secure was I um, in in school? How well did I present? You know, all of those those social determinants of health and well-being start to impact, right? So if if I'm if you know there's there's violence in my home, um, then I'm probably not getting the sleep that I require. You know, I don't trust others as much as as perhaps my peers do if they need support or help. So those things really start to impact you. And then you think about somebody whose grandma and mother and now themselves have lived in that legacy of violence. Mm. And you, you can see how 
hope can be eroded. Self-confidence is certainly gone. If you're living in a violent situation, your you, self-confidence is always eroded because that is one of the foundations of manipulation and power and control, right? It's all your fault. It's not the perpetrator's fault. You know, when we work with kids in our in our in our kids program, one of the biggest key learnings we give them is who's responsible for the violence. Because once that's lifted from you as a we one, then you don't have the shame. You're not, you know, you have so much more opportunity to grow and develop and trust your worthiness. But when you're living in a in a violent environment, in, in an abusive environment, that perpetrator of, of abuse is putting the responsibility for your experiences onto you rather than onto their behavior. So I, I think that that violence impacts uh, people from a very young age. I was I was talking with somebody the other day and they were saying about how, you know, kids coming into university who, who come from poverty are advantaged because they get a free education. And I said, there's no advantage to being poor, <laughs> you know, and 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 having access perhaps to grant programs. I'm not saying that that individual's insight was was correct, but having access to those programs um, is not very helpful if your whole childhood is about surviving. You know, yeah. what are the chances of you even finishing? Uh, school? What are the chances of you being able to get grades that are adequate enough to get you into high school? What are the chances of you being able to integrate the learning if, if you are constantly in a war zone, which is really what what abuse is. And it's it's unpredictable and it's chaotic and it doesn't allow for um, great opportunities or it doesn't necessarily allow one to access um, programs or trust others, that there are allies out there that can help support you. So I think when I talk about multi-generational abuse, and, and we see we see that um, certainly uh, with the legacy, the colonial legacy, that Canada is, 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 has perpetuated and is faced with around Indigenous children and Indigenous children being, you know, taken from from their communities and and educated in a really oppressive system and and i i, I mean the tragedy and we've known about the genocide forever um but now the 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 exposure of all the mass graves and and just the impacts to indigenous folks and we can see how any time you treat a group of people poorly, then it's harder and harder for those people to, well, one, they have to heal before they can become the nurturers and the leaders. And, and, and um, so I think it's really important to understand that when you are exposed to, to violence and, and then it almost it becomes normalized, right? right. And you're not yeah. expecting uh, your community to support you. You're not expecting your teachers necessarily to support you, and you don't get to access. Uh, that's that's the you don't get to access um, resources that potentially could help to build your self esteem and your and your confidence. So, I I, I think poverty is a tragedy in a in a nation as wealthy as ours and yeah. i think and and then and and the exploitation you know as as our nation grows stronger we're also you know we take more and more of our menial labor offshore and exploit other labor markets to to feed our consumption yeah. habits it, like it, it, it becomes a cycle. It, yeah, it, it, I, I hear you on that. And, and doing so much work with uh, in the developing world does become become a cycle. And thank you for sharing your your personal story as as, as well. And and you know, and and yet here you are, and, and over twenty seven years uh, in a leadership role. So we we know it can be achieved by many um, and I've had the opportunity to interview a few people who have uh, come from abusive families and have 
struggled a ton, but somehow w were able to see the other side and, and become leaders. So it's incredible. Now, what, what, uh, and again, I'm going to ask you a number just, and it doesn't have to be completely accurate, but a percentage do you think of people that, that go to Huronia transition homes or people in shelters for that matter, uh, what percentage of them do you think have had abusive families or have come from abusive families and found themselves in that situation again? So the two things I'd like to say right off the hop is, um, Absolutely. We many, many, many of the people I we serve, I would say 80% of the people that we serve in shelter, especially have uh, are not. Um, they they have had experienced violence in their families of origin, I would say that. And I want to be really I'm clear about something um, in terms of Poverty doesn't cause abuse, mm -hmm. but what happens is that poverty often will eliminate ways out, right? So that so that the chances of uh, the violence or abuse becoming more lethal or or longer lasting is there, because we also know that um, power and control and violence in intimate relationships is very demographic or democratic, I'm sorry, that um, that it, it transcends all races and all classes. But I think what we now also realize is that poverty just compounds the impact of violence against women and children. Okay, great. Thanks for that clarification. So moving more on to the, the business side of, of a charity, and uh, as we know, charities, they that really is it's non for profit, and um, one of your initiatives, in addition to counseling and helping children, was creating Operation Grow. Tell us a little bit about Operation Grow and what, how does that help the women at the shelter, or does it help other women? But tell us how that empowers women. Absolutely, absolutely. So Operation Grow. Um, came actually from the women we serve. The women we did, when we do our strategic planning in our organization at HTH, which is, you know, the, the Women's Shelter Plus Counseling Program, Sexual Assault Center. And uh, we always talk to the women um, as our key stakeholders. You know, when, when corporations go out and, and determine things, they're, they're, their stakeholders are, of course, their shareholders. Well, for us, our shareholders, our stakeholders are the women we serve. And, and um, what they said was that they were, I, now I'm paraphrasing, of course, but they were, they were hungry, they, they were impoverished, and they were lonely. And those, though, I mean, when you leave an abusive relationship, women tend to be very isolated because that is one of the tactics of abuse is to keep keep individuals isolated socially isolated and break down their networks so there's less they're less likely to to leave and uh in a you know in in in, in extreme ex circumstances um and so from that we decided and it, it, it was the board's decision that we were going to build a social enterprise and so then we went to the drawing board to to think about what we could do. And we we had done a, a couple of uh, we pursued a couple of business ideas because we knew that we we wanted we wanted to build a social enterprise that, of course, was sustainable and that would give back to the community as a social enterprise should. And um, and that's how we came to Operation Grow. So we did a lot of research. And that was the beauty of developing something from the ground up rather than trying to fit a program into a, uh, a government funded um, call, right? And I'm not saying government funding has been, has been very, very important, but we wanted, we, we heard from the women, you know, hungry, uh, poor and lonely and, and from there, we decided that our, our social enterprise really needed to address food security and that we, we could do that possibly through, uh, we, wanted, we wanted something that would build women's skills as well. 
right? We wanted to give them an employment opportunity um, because as I said, so many of the women that we we heard from, and they, I'm, I'm speaking about third generation women now. So their, their grandmas, their mothers, and now themselves have been through the shelter. And that happens a lot. And you see that more in smaller communities, I think, because there's less mobility perhaps, or I, I, I to, to be honest with you, I haven't thought about the, the reasons why, but other than the systemic nature of, that we've already talked about those things. Um, so we started to imagine what it would be like to build a holistic social enterprise. And, and we uh, came up with the idea of a vertical farm. And that's what Operation Grow is. It's a hydroponic farm and it's growing food. And we know that that's an emerging market and a, an emerging industry that is um, becoming more and more popular. So we thought, ah, if we, can, if we can offer women an employment opportunity in a vertical farm and train them how to be farmers, then we can also address some of those issues around uh, income security. So uh, Operation Grow is, is farming, it's developing skills for women in our employment program. But we also recognize that the impacts of violence, um, in order to, to address the impacts of violence, we also needed to address the lonely piece. So the social networking aspect, it was to, to be able to provide women with an opportunity and a space to come together with their peers, not in a, not a, not a, a therapeutic relationship. That was another thing the women said, that they wanted to build friendships and mm -hmm. not just more service related relationships. And we also looked at how does one effectively heal from trauma? And the evidence is indicating that as much as we do need to do talk therapy in order to heal uh, from, our, from our trauma experiences, that the mind-body connection is really critical and that yoga and meditation are so, um, so helpful in, in healing from the impacts of trauma. So it, uh, Operation Grow is really an evidence-based model where we, we have the social enterprise, we have uh, employment training. So any woman with a lived experience of violence in our area can become a member of Operation Grow. And that's all they need to do is, 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 is indicate that they've had a lived experience of, of violence. They don't have to come through our programs. Okay. It's open to 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 all women, and then from there they get to they have a whole menu of, of things that they can choose from, whether they want to uh, uh, try to engage in the employment program, which is vertical farming. We also offer uh, training and and work in terms of building maintenance. They can just come for yoga or meditation. We also have a uh, commercial kitchen and uh, we do cooking workshops with with women and our, our retail store of course to sell all our wonderful produce and prepared goods so so many questions first one being the community them the community far as buying your products uh, are you meeting the demand and are or are you getting enough demand I'd love to say yes to both, and it, it depends. So um, it is a large facility. I mean, large for us. It's not, you know, it's uh, we we are in a steep learning curve around becoming farmers. You mm. know, when we first envisioned this, we thought, oh yes, hydroponic farming. It, it's you know, we the, myself and my director of operations, Haley McDonald, we're both avid food growers and we're like that's no problem well it's a bit more complicated than that the technology for us is easy to grasp but the there's a lot of moving parts in a hydroponic farm so we have at times had an abundance of produce and and not as many customers as we would like and at that time we would redistribute that food we would make sure the food isn't going to waste but what happens more frequently now is we will have a, what I call a bad weather system in the farm. And, and um, at times um, 
our farm, our crops are hit with some kind of damage. And so we're not able to meet the supply. So we are very much uh, a new business model and we are in the growing stages of that. So um, we have huge amount of community support and we want to grow that support. Um, we have had several hurdles that have that have come in in developing this this model one being um just after we finished the build we we had some hvac uh mechanical issues that actually promoted some mold growth so we had to close down the building and and address mm -hmm. those those issues um and then of course the pandemic has been a challenge um so we we will get there, but I would say, as any new as any new business, um, we're not always there. We do have great understanding from our community, so yeah. we've got a great farmer now who understands hydroponic farming, and um, we're we're well on our way. But a small error in terms of um, forgetting to set the um, the water system to auto, you know, those sorts of things can can result in a huge amount of damage. So it's been a it's been a large learning curve for us. So how many hours could uh, Somebody someone work. get working at Operation Grow, yeah. and it, is it enough hours to get food on the table? Right. Right now, our employment program really is about building building confidence in in your ability or in women's ability to come to work and do work so it is not at this point in time uh, full-time employment what it is is it's it's um it was really designed for women as who as we said has have had a legacy of violence in their lives and really need that support and um uh, to and confidence building so that they know that they can re-enter the workforce so right now what we after uh, uh individuals have gone through the vertical farming training then they at this point in time can work for up to three hours a week so it really is a income supplement at a living wage but they can they can work three hours a week um, however having said that we have had positions open up in the farm uh, for people who are, 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 we've been able to employ members full time at, at different stages in, in our farming. And, and we currently have a, a woman who, who was at, at one time a, a member of Operation Grow working three hours a week, who is now working full time in the farm. So our, our hope is to be able to train and support women to become confident vertical cultivators in a hydroponic farm and be able to move on from Operation Grow and work in an, in an emerging industry. Which is, which is great. So that thanks for that, because that gives a lot more context around it. Now, that being said, uh, social enterprises, there's tons of definitions for them. And, you know, I'm a mission and profit mate for to the sake of uh, argument. And some social enterprises are for profit and some social enterprises are not for profit. So mine is a for profit, which really you know, as I've explained to many people, means it's my salary. It's the same as an offer profit because they get paid. So it, anyway, it's semantics, but it's an important one that I'm trying to explain to people these days. Uh, is your social enterprise a not-for-profit social enterprise or a for-profit social enterprise? We'd like to make profit, but we're under a not-for-profit. Um, we are registered not-for-profit. So what would happen to profit within Operation Grow is that it would be reinvested, and it is reinvested in the programming uh, for for members. And and ultimately, if 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 Operation Grow's business um, develops the way it should, then it should also support some of the other and the other programs and initiatives because we do not receive enough funding to operate all of our programs within uh, 
so you know we rely heavily on the support in our community and i know there you're right there are so many different definitions of social enterprise but we are we are in that that uh that place where uh not-for-profit meets um a a business goal or a business determination and Yes. What, what, how do you define social enterprise or? Well, just... well it, you know, I, it, 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 it's the mission leads. So yeah. your, your intention is the mission leads, but it doesn't mean you can't make money doing it. So you're creating it to fill a social gap in, in the, your community world, whatever that may be, but that's, what's driving um, the initiative. And that's why I, I say, you know, you, me, we, it's the mission leading. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I could have stayed with my very profitable company before. It wasn't necessarily the mission leading, but I wanted my mission to lead. And, and you do get affected financially that way regardless. That being said, um, what you're saying, though, is, you know, yeah, we're OK making profit, but either way, it's going to go into Huronia Transition Homes and the program. So it still could be a poor for profit social enterprise, but it's going into the nonprofit. Yeah, well, right. it is registered. Operation Grow is registered as one of our programs under okay, okay. our under our our, okay. our not for profit or our charitable status. Um, and and there are definitely there are social enterprises that are not as you as you've indicated that are not registered and there is not a a clear cut definition um, uh, and I think there is the piece that is 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 absolutely critical in a social enterprise and that is that you know you are building you are building a model for positive impact in the community and 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 uh something that's sustainable right you want to build sustainability and positive impact so let's go there uh because I, I i know i have so many questions for you and i'm gonna ask you just one more here and then i'm gonna get into some leadership questions before we wrap up you know going into the sustainability piece as Operation Grow, as you said, you can't get all your funding from the government. So has Operation Grow helped with that sustainability provide because you are creating now an income? Operation Grow, uh, once it meets its full potential, okay. I would say would provide. I would say we're very much in the growing phase of our, our, of our business model. And I think um, it's uh, it's a new way for us to be thinking as a as an organization, and it's also it's also a challenging to recruit and find um, employees to work at Operation Grow that understand both, mm -hmm. right? That it can can focus on um, making good business decisions while also supporting and being really empathetic to women. And I'm not saying that the two play are exclusive, right? Or they, but I think that when we, we, um, we have, we're still developing the business side of things. And I think that there, it also is the, 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 the business has been growing considerably year over year it's not at a place right now where it's profitable absolutely not and the pandemic hit you know yeah. and operation bros business uh, also relies on uh, providing beautiful meeting spaces in our community and 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 catering meetings and having um, other groups using that space to to provide service to our community. So a large piece of our business was was certainly impacted by the pandemic. And on the flip side of that, our retail store and our farm became an essential service. And that's been a really good reveal for us, right? That we are providing uh, such, a, such a great service to the community in, in, in doing food prep and in doing vertical farming and in supplying, you know, people with fresh produce, you know, lettuce, kale, herbs, 
um, all year round. And, and uh, it, was, it was lovely to see the growth in sales in our retail store um, mm -hmm. during the pandemic. So what advice would you give in starting to a non for to a not for profit? What advice would you give them in starting a social initiative, a social enterprise, particularly to help subsidize for the future? I think the biggest piece of advice I have to give is listen to your stakeholders, really listen to your stakeholders and find out what they want. Mm -hmm. Because when we were building Operation Grow, they're, they're like our, our, our building costs, our construction costs went a, you know, a million dollars over budget. That is, that doubled what I, we thought our budget was to be up and operating the, the vertical farm and the pro and, and up the whole social enterprise. Um, and although I was really concerned and lost a lot of sleep about, about being able to fund uh, the capital side of the project, I never, ever doubted the the success of the program side once it was launched because we'd done our research. So I think, you know, evidence-based uh, programming or evidence-based models are maybe uh, something that's overused, but we've had lots of, lots of folks come to us from different communities. Um, lots of councils have toured our facilities. Lots of places have come because they've wanted to replicate. We've been asked if we would become a uh, something, you know, where we would go and train others. And it's like, you got to talk to the people in your community and find out what they want and what your stakeholders yeah. want, right? Rather than building yet something else that people get to come to, get them building it because if they build it, they will own it. Yeah. And they will want to be a part of it. And that is so key. If they build it, they will own it. And if you do it for them, yeah. then it's it's what it's your success not their success um it's so such great advice and experience that a lot firsthand so that's excellent uh one question before we go to our uh fire questions our fast fast and furious questions is you know you lead 50 people and the in an environment that is, I would imagine would be quite emotionally challenging. How do you keep those 50 people to the best of your ability engaged and staying, uh, showing up every day in a positive way under that weight of continuous abuse of the, the beneficiary and the stakeholders? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think one thing is you really have to listen to people. You really have to, you have to remind them about how important they are in, in the role or the mission and the mandate of the organization. And you have to stay like what you said earlier is so key. You have to stay focused on your mandate, right? When we, when we first started to, and and so I'll let me finish there. You have to stay focused and we have to understand that the work is really difficult, but it is also so incredibly noble, like to be able to bear witness to and support people who are sometimes in the the worst place they've ever imagined being. So it is about really then if, if we're expecting staff to be compassionate and respectful and understanding to the women we serve, then we have to, that has to be all the way throughout the organization. We have to really listen and we have to try our best to, to understand what people's struggles are. And, and it's, we're not always wonderful at it, you know, we, but we, we make, we, we work, we, we try to get feedback for big decisions. We talk to people what the, about the impacts are. We think long and hard about policies, policy implications. And, and I think with that, we do work really hard to have the difficult conversations and hear from folks exactly where they're at and what they need and be like being honest, being an honest leader is a really important thing. I think it's not that you can always, you, 
you can't always deliver what people want but if you're honest about why it is that you're delivering what it is then i think that that's really helpful Look, i give you a really quick example we uh, we are in we are currently developing our vaccination policy and and even the conversations about that because we're faced with a public health health crisis that we've not seen before and um and we believe in empowering women and individual rights and autonomy so how do you balance the philosophical uh, about uh, individual rights and autonomies with the public health needs right so it is about having those conversations and 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 really being honest and forthright with people where there is the ability to um seek input and where there isn't. I think leadership is really about being honest and being respectful and also understanding that you are never going to please everybody. If yeah. uh, like you can't if you're if you're leading well and with integrity, there are there are always times and and I think one of the biggest um uh, reflections I ask employees to always do is how will this benefit the women we serve or how will this impact the women we serve so every policy decision is 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 taken through that lens um, yeah and that which is which you know always going towards that that mission is ultimately the goal because we are we are needing to wrap up from a time perspective if if um, these are going to be some short sharp answers so uh sort of one sentence answers <laughs> okay well, you, you can see i'm really really do that well right <laughs> yes, yes. Or, or we'll see how and listen the information you're providing us is fabulous so not not but these ones got to be short and sharp so we'll see how we go uh what is one thing you wish you knew prior to engaging down the path and i'll say down the path of operation grow because to focus that I wish I had the foresight to hire more folks in the development and not think that I could do it all. And by it all, I mean, you know, myself and my director of ops, we needed, we, we, uh, we developed Operation Grow and we maintained the rest of the organization. Yeah. You need to have enough people to, to do the job well. Yeah. Great, thank you. Worst piece of advice you've ever received? Worst piece of advice I have ever received? I'd, I'd blank okay. there. Blank. How about I'm best blank. piece of advice you've ever received? Um, best piece of advice, oh boy, these ones are difficult for me. I'm sorry, I'm it's, failing. It's you're not failing. How about we just do this one and call it a day? What three values do you live by? Respect, integrity, and compassion. Fabulous. I'm going to wrap up and I'm going to come back to you with one more question though. So stay tuned for that question. Thank you everybody for joining us today uh, with Kathy with some great insight and passion for what she's been doing for over 27 years. And our communities are grateful to you, Kathy, for what you've been doing for over 27 years. You can subscribe to Wisdom Exchange TV so you receive each new interview notification in your inbox. And please share your interview by going to the share button located on each of the guest pages. And you'll also get this in podcasts and you can get find it wherever you listen to podcasts or you can listen to it on the page as well as the video. Now, if you know someone who's had a significant social impact in business, education, civic service, or advocacy, let us know. Visit the guest tab on wisdomexchangetv.com and submit the information and our research team will do the rest. And do you want to live your most meaningful life? And if you do, and you want to have a social impact, or more importantly, you do already have a social impact, join us at Yumi Week Community, Women Driving Social Impact. So this is a great community that brings women together, talking about what they need to grow and increase their impact. So coming back to you, Kathy, do you have any words of wisdom for the audience regarding how to contribute to society and make their contribution count? 
I think it's important to broach that, find something that you're passionate about, and 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 rather than trying to to go with the answers, go with the questions. You know, meet up with something that you love and you're passionate about, because then you're not going to get tired, and you can also then really your your impact can be so much more profound if you understand and and you and you approach with questions rather than answers. I think that that's a really critical piece. Oh, you gave me shivers with that, and that's really what the you and you me we is all about is finding out what's important to the to the need first and questions before answers. Love it. Until next time, everyone, make your contribution count for you, me, we. This episode is sponsored by Make Your Contribution Count for You, Me, We, a book written by Suzanne F. Stevens. It's time to act. Let this book be your compass to having a sustainable social impact while living your most meaningful life. Visit youmewe.ca slash book for more information. Thank you for joining us for the You Me We Amplified, women leaving social impact in their communities and beyond podcast. For more interviews, visit youmewe.ca slash podcast. Until next time, make your contribution count for you, your organization, and your community.